<clears throat> so, um, as you know, uh, every year the the uh, the BSCB um, uh, um, gives a medal for someone at the peak of their um, creativity and career um, who uh, who has really made seminal contributions to Sabaji, who we expect to uh, keep going and uh, to do beautiful work in the future. And uh, there have been uh, many uh, of the you know best um, people in the UK uh, in the past have won these medals. People like Anne Ridley, Matthew Freeman, Frank Gorman, Alex Gould, and lots of other. All our winners have been exceptional scientists. But I think it's especially fitting this year the winner um, uh, that he get the Hook Medal because uh, um, Hook was uh, one of these um, people who wasn't just a biologist. He was working at the between disciplines, and he spent his time doing architecture, but also making making things, making machines, making microscopes and telescopes to look at things. And it's through this combination of new technology, the ability to look at things you couldn't see before, that Hook really transformed um, biology and gave us the first image, um, like we see the it's beautiful images, and Micrographia, his book, um, has these beautiful images where he showed, for example, the beauty of the flea. So before that, people didn't really see beauty in strange organisms as we do all the time these days. But he was the one who gave us this ability to look at this microscopic world afresh and the beauty of it. And um, Thomas Surrey, our winner this year, is someone who, who has gone to the next level and shown us the beauty of uh, things at even the smaller scale and how how life emerges from the self-organization of cytoskeletal elements, particularly microtubules. And he's done this work um, both working with Stan Liebler um, in the US and then afterwards working uh, with Eric Cassenti and colleagues in uh, EMBL. And then he got a position in EMBL um, after doing beautiful postdoc work, really looking at uh, microtubular self-organization and came to the UK uh, um, several years ago now uh, where he works at the what will now be the Crick Institute. And he continues to, uh, to, sh to really um, throw real mechanistic light on how you take a, 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 molecule, a protein, you polymerize it, make it dynamic, and you get emergent living behavior um, at the large scale. So I won't say more about his work because he can say it much more beautiful than me, beautifully than me. So Thomas, we'd just like to award you the medal. <laughs> So it's a picture of the, the Hooks microscope and on the back from the British Society. Society. So, Brilliant. <laughs> thank you very, very much. <laughs> very kind. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for the nice introduction, Buzz. And thanks a lot for this prize. It's a big honor, of course. And um, so what I would like to do today is um, I would like to show you some examples of our work um, that uh, highlight I hope the power of biochemical in vitro reconstitutions with the aim of uh, gaining mechanistic insight into how um, molecules of the cytoskeleton work. And um, this should hopefully not be only interesting for the biochemist, but also for the cell biologist, and maybe even the developmental biologist. And um, the issue that fascinates me with the cytoskeleton is its dynamic nature, which is here nicely illustrated, I think, in... Um, in various cycles of nuclear divisions uh, filmed by Ivo Telly, a postdoc in the lab, in a Drosophila embryo extract. And what we see here is that um, the cytoskeleton has to be very dynamic and reorganize itself constantly and respond to external cues. So if you would like to understand a complicated system like this, maybe a good starting point would be to ask um, how many components do you have to deal with? And uh, this has been done by proteomics, um, for example, in the field of the mitotic spindle. And the result of this uh, was that several hundred proteins uh, bind to mitotic spindles that are, have been partially purified. So it's quite a large system. And you might wonder, are really all these components necessary? Um, are they all important? Maybe they just hang out there. And this has been looked at um, by functional genomics. So the, this was the attempt to systematically look at the functions of gene products for a certain process, for example, like cell division. And the answer here was also that uh, we need hundreds of proteins. They all play an important role uh, in cell division. So there's a problem here. 
And the problem is the problem of complexity. So how can we understand um, molecular mechanisms um, in processes that are driven by so many components? And by understand, I really mean trying to understand the properties of the system um, as it emerges from the, um, from the properties of the molecules. So you might wonder, um, how can we explain things like uh, shape and size and function um, terminology we use in cell biology um, from the knowledge of the properties of the molecules that we can very well describe with a, uh, and measure with the methods that biochemistry and biophysics uh, provide. And uh, so I always think we should have a bit of hope. Maybe some proteins are more important than others. So how can we find out about the important ones? And in the field of um, cell division and especially spindle assembly, um, reducing the complexity of the system has been quite successful. Um, what has been done here is um, the Xenopus egg extract has been used where parts of the system have been removed and you could still maintain some of the properties of, of your system. So you see here in the experiment uh, from Rebecca Heald where she managed to um, reconstitute uh, spindles first around DNA-coated beads, and then later, this is her latest experiment, around a bead which is covered with a single protein um, which has been put into the um, Xenopus egg extract. So of course, these spindles, they cannot divide the DNA anymore but um, they maintain some of the properties of the original spindle. And in this case, what you can study is still bipolar arrangement of microtubule arrays. And the completely opposite approach has been very successful in the cytoskeleton field. And this is in vitro reconstitution from the bottom up. And this started out with um, reconstitutions of um, actin-based motility in the Carlier and Theriot labs, um, who could show that a small number of molecules can reconstitute um, bead motility in vitro. Um, together with François Nedelec in the labs of Stan Leibler and Eric Hassenti, uh, we could show that molecular motors can organize, uh, can organize microtubules uh, into asters, which are a bit similar to the poles of spindles. And the lab of Dyke Mullins could show that using um, molecules of the bacterial cytoskeleton um, that normally segregate plasmid DNA, you can also in vitro um, push plastic beads apart from each other. And once you have such systems, you can really dissect them and get at the mechanisms, the molecular mechanisms of how these molecules work. And um, this is the work we like to do in our lab. And today I would like to show you three recent examples of uh, what we did. And um, they uh, deal with, uh, in the first case, with growing microtubules and how you can assemble a large protein, comparatively large protein interaction network at the growing microtubule ends. Um, in the second part, I would like to talk a little bit about some progress um, that we made by uh, looking at these end-tracking proteins to better understand uh, what is really the mechanism that makes the microtubule decide to stop to grow. And um, since microtubules, after depolymerization, have to be remade, and this is a regulated con uh, process in the cell, it's also interesting to try to um, understand better the mechanism of uh, the regulation of microtubule nucleation in the cells. So these are three topics we worked on recently, and I would like to show you some examples. And um, so the approach here will always be using in vitro biochemistry with purified proteins, um, but look at the behavior of the molecules under the microscope. So this requires a bit of assay development, and then a quantitative analysis of the images that you see. So, um, we have to start with just reminding ourselves um, that microtubules can switch between two states, um, a state of constant growth and shrinkage. And uh, electron microscopy has demonstrated that the ends of such microtubules um, differ between growing and shrinking uh, states. And maybe it's not surprising that there are molecules around that can distinguish between uh, these configurations at the ends. And um, they have been described something like, uh, discovered something like 15 years ago. And the first example um, you see here, this is, um, oops, this is the protein clip 170. This is a movie which um, was made in the lab of Thomas Kreis in Geneva. 
And a year later, another protein was discovered um, called EB1, which shows a very similar behavior and uh, which tracks exclusively growing microtubule ends in cells. In the meantime, we have a whole zoo of these end tracking proteins and they um, perform lots of different functions and this is just a very crude overview of what they do. So they mediate interactions um, with subcellular structures and this has been studied very carefully in yeast where they deliver growth factors to the cell wall. They mediate microtubule membrane links. Um, they mediate interactions between the actin cytoskeleton and microtubules and um, they are important for initiation of vesicle transport, and this is something I would like to come back to. And many of them also regulate in some or the other way the dynamics of the microtubules directly. And Peter Bieling in the lab, he succeeded in reconstituting this um, placent tracking phenomenon um, maybe 10 years ago now. And um, the assay he developed was he um, put uh, stabilized pieces of microtubules on a glass cover slip, added uh, free tubulin, fluorescently labeled, and then purified, um, in this case, protein EB1, and he could then observe under the microscope um, how microtubules grew, and this EB1 protein selectively localizes to these growing microtubule ends. And you see this here in a chymograph. Um, this is a space-time plot where you see the localization of these molecules to the growing microtubule end. So this experiment is nice because it demonstrated that this protein, EB1, is an autonomous end binding protein. So it can go to microtubule ends just by itself. But this is not a given for most of these other end binding proteins um, because this CLIP170 protein, which was um, shown to be an end tracker first, um, does not show this behavior. So when you add this to microtubules in vitro, you don't see anything spectacular. But if you add now unlabeled EB1, um, you see that now this unlabeled EB1 can recruit CLIP170 to microtubule ends. And this agreed very nicely with uh, data um, from cell biological experiments that uh, showed that EB1 was required for CLIP170 end tracking. But this experiment now furthermore demonstrates that EB1 is not only necessary but also sufficient uh, to recruit CLIP170 to growing microtubule ends. In the meantime, we know much more about how microtubule end tracking works thanks to the work of several labs. And quite important was uh, structural work here. And um, you see here schematically the structure of this EB1 protein. It's a dimer. It has two Kalponin homology domains at the end terminus that interact with um, the mic microtubule. And the C-terminal part interacts with um, proteins it recruits and uh, EB1 recruits most other of these end tracking proteins. And there are sort of two classes. Um, the first class uh, contain calpotin homology domains, although not all calpotin homology domains bind to EB1. And then there's a very large group of proteins that contain a linear SXIP motif that was discovered by the labs of uh, Michel Steinmetz and Anna Achmanova. And um, these proteins bind to the C-terminus of EB1. And this is the, it defines the mechanism of how most of the end tracking in cells work. Uh, the trouble is there are many of these proteins and uh, one gets the impression that there is some sort of a complicated protein interaction network at uh, growing microtubule ends. And uh, it's not so easy to understand how these proteins all work together um, as a system. And I would like to uh, show you an example of how we try to understand uh, the logic behind such networks by reconstituting them, focusing on these proteins, which I um, show here in, in this slide. So this concerns the end tracking of um, the motor protein dynein together with its accessory uh, uh, protein complex partner, dynactin. Dynein and dynactin are usually known as transporters and not so much as end tracking proteins, but it has been shown um, in neurons especially, and in fungi, um, that dynactin is very important and the property of end tracking is important for initiation um, transport that is dynein dependent. And dynactin has been shown in cells to be an EB1 dependent microtubule end tracker, 
And um, however, it is also dependent um, on this protein CLIP170 here. So it looks a bit complicated. And um, a lot of biochemistry work, which is summarized in this slide here, uh, done with fragments of proteins, has revealed a number of interactions between different domains of this um, dynactin component P150, um, EB1, and CLIP170. So how does this network really function? Um, so what's clear is that the EB1 tail in vitro binds to isolated cap glidomains. So this is an interaction which has been demonstrated to exist in vitro. But why does then this P150 uh, require both EB1 and CLIP170 for end tracking? There's another issue uh, that concerns the interaction between P150 and uh, dynein. Uh, in the recent years, we have learned a lot about uh, the dynein and dynactin structure, uh, largely due to the lab of Andrew Carter at the LMB in Cambridge. And I show here from a recent review of his um, a model for the dynein structure and a model for the dynactin structure. And this P150 protein, which is needed for the end tracking of dynactin, um, is this part here which sticks out of the dynactin structure and the cap glidomain um, is modeled to be here. So it's a bit the question how accessible this cap glidomain really is. Um, a few years ago we have reconstituted the human dynein complex and to our surprise found that in contrast to the yeast dynein and in contrast to what was thought before, um, it was not processive but then the Carter lab and the Veil lab, they showed very nicely that um, there is a processivity switch which depends on adapter proteins that can switch the dynein dynactin complex into a very processive mode. And the recent structure from the Carter lab also gives you an idea of how this, um, in this case, this adapter protein big D holds together the dynein and the dynactin inducing conformational changes that lead to processive motion. And in this configuration, we imagine the um, cup glide domain to be up here. So how do we get dynein uh, or dynactin uh, to the microtool plus ends where they should start their run? So let's start simply, and uh, let's start with a fragment of P170, so this dynactin component, and just look at what P150 does together with microtools. And in this case, if you use a comparatively low concentration, um, you, do not, you do not see much interaction. In contrast, when you now add unlabeled EB1, very similar to the situation in the CLIP170 experiment, you see recruitment of P150 um, to EB1 in agreement with the biochemical data. So P150 gets recruited by EB1. Um, since there are all these SXIP proteins in the cell, it might be interesting to look at how SXIP, in this case peptides, compete um, with P150 recruitment by EB1. And if you add an excess of SXIP peptides um, to this experiment, mimicking the situation in the cell, you see that you can suppress now the recruitment of the P150 to growing microtubule ends. The interesting thing is that uh, when you now add on top of that CLIP170, uh, CLIP170 can recruit P150 again because it is able to displace some of these SXIP proteins very efficiently. And what is happening here is that an additional binding site for P150 that exists at the C-terminus of CLIP170 to which SXIP proteins cannot bind is now used by the P150 protein. So we have a hierarchical recruitment mode where in the presence of competition, um, CLIP170 can sort of rescue the recruitment of the dynactin component P150 to microtubule ends. So all this was done with a P150 fragment. Um, how about the how about the dynactin complex itself? So this is some uh, recent experiment done by Rupam Ya in the lab, 
And um, she purified the dynactin complex and she used our recombinant GFP dynein. And when you add this to dynamic microtubules, you do not see much interaction with the microtubule ends as you would expect because these two together are not very processive. But if you add now EB1, you will see that now the dynein complex via EB1 and dynactin can be recruited to the growing microtubule ends, which is easily um, documented in this uh, chymograph here. And if you now in addition add this um, adapter protein, um, you can see some starts of runs uh, from within the microtubule, but also from the microtubule end where the end tracking occurred. So we get some initiation of processive runs from microtubule ends um, after adding in addition also these adapter proteins. So altogether, this uh, protein interaction network, um, we imagine works like this. We have um, EB1 as the main recruitment protein of end tracking proteins to the microtubule end. And depending on the amount of the recruited proteins and maybe on their regulatory state, CLIP 170 uh, can auto inhibit itself and this auto inhibition is influenced by phosphorylation reactions. We can either recruit uh, more CLIP 170 or less CLIP 170 to growing microtubule ends, which will then recruit P150 together with the dynactin complex, which um, can bind to the dining complex. All right, so this was the most complicated uh, plus and tracking network we could reconstitute so far. Now I move to the much simpler system in terms of composition, and I would like to address the question of um, the GTP cap. So we all know that when microtubules grow, they incorporate tubulin in a GTP bound state, and the idea is that when uh, the microtubules start to depolymerize that they have lost this GTP cap. The trouble is uh, we cannot see the GTP. So strictly speaking, we do not know how big the GTP cap is. And if you look into the literature, you will see that there's a little bit of a disagreement between different labs of um, how big the GTP cap uh, should be. All these experiments, they essentially derive the size of the GTP cap indirectly and uh, therefore we probably still don't know exactly how big the GTP cap is. And more importantly, we don't know how much of it is actually lost when the microtubule decides to shrink. So we thought since EB proteins recognize the end of the microtubule, uh, maybe they can tell us the answer. And all this started with this question here. This is a apparently unrelated question, but initially we wanted to know um, how EB proteins uh, bind to the growing microtubule end. And you can imagine various scenarios, but two very reasonable scenarios are these two here. So on the left-hand side, um, you can imagine that uh, EB proteins simply copolymerize together with tubulin, bind to the growing microtubule end, stay there for a while, and then fall off. In contrast, there could be a conformational difference between the region at microtubule ends and the rest of the microtubule. And this conformational difference could be recognized by EB proteins, so they could have a higher affinity to a different conformation at microtubule ends. And in order to distinguish between these two possibilities, what you need to do, you need to measure the length of this region to which uh, EB proteins bind and compare this to the single molecule binding unbinding turnover. It's a very simple experiment, and this is what we did. So you see here um, example images of microtubules grown at different growth velocities, slow growth, fast growth, and then you see the quantitation of the fluorescence profiles, and uh, you see that when microtubules grow faster, the regions to which EB1 proteins bind are longer. This is in agreement with some models of the GTP cap. What you also can extract from such me measurements is that hundreds of uh, tubulins um, form the binding region of these EB proteins. Uh, and um, you can also extract more quantitatively a number from these lengths and the knowledge of the growth velocity of microtubules. You can conclude that um, freshly added tubulins, they remain covered 
with EB proteins roughly for eight seconds under these experimental conditions here. And um, if the EB proteins um, bind there due to a copolymerization mechanism, we would expect that the dwell time of EB proteins is in the same range. But when you measure this in single molecule experiments, you see that the dwell time is much shorter. So the dwell time is in the 100 milliseconds range. And um, this means that we cannot have a copolymerization mechanism, but that EB proteins indeed recognize a conformation at microtubule ends, which is different from the rest of the microtubule. And this starts to make um, the, uh, this mechanism by which EB proteins bind to microtubule ends very interesting because they can tell us something about the conformation we can otherwise not see. Okay, where do they bind? Um, in order to get a more uh, detailed understanding of where on the microtubule these EV protein bind, uh, we looked at uh, cryo-electron microscopy images and uh, Sebastian Maurer and Frank von Jol in the lab, they uh, using single particle analysis method, um, they developed a model that shows where the microtubule binding domain of these EB proteins bind. And they are seen between the protofilaments, and more precisely, they're seen at the corners of four tubulins in the lattice. So this would be one tubulin dimer, another one, another one, and another one. And this is an interesting spot to bind, because if you tilt the microtubule a little bit towards you, you one can see that this is very close to the GTP that gets hydrolyzed at the microtubule end. So these EB proteins indeed are ideally positioned to sense conformational uh, changes potentially induced by the GTPA cycle. So maybe we have a GTPA uh, sensor here in our hands. If that's the case, we have a certain expectation of what the binding sites for EB proteins should do before a catastrophe, before the microtubules start shrinking, and this is uh, shown here. So this is a chymograph, uh, time and space, so the microtubule grows and shrinks and grows and shrinks. And we are now interested in what happens directly at the transition from growth to shrinkage. So you can analyze um, this quantitatively, and you can average many events with respect to the time point of catastrophe. And you see here the growth history of two experiments of slowly growing and fast growing microtubules that then have a catastrophe. So you see fast shrinkage here. If you now look at the corresponding EB1 signal, you see that over a time of several seconds, um, the EB1 signal goes down before the catastrophe occurs. So this means because the turnover of the EB molecules is so fast, that actually the binding sites disappear a few seconds before the microtubule has a catastrophe. So that's interesting. Um, that could suggest that here, on average data, we might see how the protective cap of the microtubule is lost before catastrophe. So can we go a bit further? And this is what Christian Dülberg in the lab did. Um, he essentially repeated a very classical experiment in the field of the uh, the microtubule by chemistry, done roughly 25 years ago by Walker et al. And this is the so-called dilution experiment. And uh, we repeated this experiment now with uh, much improved technology, hoping that we can get additional information out of it. And what is done in this experiment is you let microtubules grow and you observe them in the microscope and you very, very quickly remove the tube to the tubulin so that the microtubules cannot grow anymore. And you ask yourself, what do the microtubules do? Do they just stop growing? Do they shrink immediately? Do they need some time to decide to shrink? This is an experiment here that shows this. So microtubules grow. In a moment, you will see that the background goes down now. The tubulin was removed when the background dropped. And then you saw that the microtubules shrank. <coughs> And an image sequence is shown here. So here was the moment of the washout of the tubulin. What you observe is that this particular microtubule here does not depolymerize immediately, but it stays put for a while, and then it shrinks. This is exactly what Walker et al. have observed uh, 25 years ago. So there's a delay before catastrophe, 
And the time of this delay is indicative of the stability of the microtubule at the moment of tubulin washout. So it's an interesting time to measure. So in contrast to what was previously done, we measured now with as high precision as we could um, the position of the microtubule ends in this experiment. And then we get curves like this, this is the pos end position of the microtubule. This is our background signal. Here the microtubule stops growing, it waits a bit, and then it has a catastrophe. Um, what we can see, because our uh, resolution or the precision of the end detection is quite high, we can see that during the waiting, the microtubule actually shrinks a bit. And it shrinks for a few hundreds of nanometers. That is interesting. <coughs> what you also saw in the movie is that not all microtubules decided to depolymerize exactly at the same time. Actually, what we see is that when we look at the microtubules at the moment of the washout, that um, they grow with a variety of growth speeds, although we are at a constant tubulin concentration. And we also see that they have, a, they have quite a range of delay times. And the delay times, so the stability of the microtubule, correlates with the growth speed of the microtubule. So that's interesting. What we also see is that there's a correlation between this depolymerization length, so the extent of the slow depolymerization phase before the catastrophe takes place with the growth speed. And um, interestingly, the mean of this depolymerization length is 200 nanometers in this experiment. This is 25 tubulins long. So this excludes immediately short cap models which have recently been fav favored and speaks more towards a long protective cap model. And what is even more interesting is that this depolymerization length is in the range of these EB binding regions. So could they be connected? So we repeated this experiment in the presence of EB proteins. So you see here the growing microtubule in the presence of EB washout microtubule shrinks. Now you can look at correlations between the length of the EB binding region and the stability of the microtubule. And you see here two examples of the same experiment. You find microtubules which, are, which have a bright signal, bright EB1 signal at the end, and other microtubules in the same experiment have a dimmer signal. And the signal intensity correlates with growth speed, just as we expect from our ensemble experiments, because faster growing microtubules have longer EB binding regions. But interestingly, this intensity also correlates with the delay time. So this tells you that at the moment of washout, the microtubules which have a long EB binding region are more stable than the microtubules with a shorter binding region. And at the moment of catastrophe, this correlation is almost completely gone. So that's interesting because we can monitor the instantaneous stability um, of microtubules in this experiment by looking very carefully at the EB1 signal. Okay, to finish up, we can quantitatively explain the delay times we see based on the kinetics we can measure independently that determine the size of the EB binding region. And what you see here is an averaged history of the slow shrinkage phase aligned with respect to the catastrophe time point. And you see that during this time, you have a roughly mono-exponential decay removal of the EB1 binding sites. And this is due to two processes in this experiment. We have continued maturation of EB binding sites or protective cap sites into old microtubule sites. And then in this particular experiment here, we also have slow depolymerization here. So these two processes um, determine the rate of the loss of the EB cap, and we can measure these rates here, and hence we can calculate um, this observed EB loss rate, which agrees nicely, and eventually we can calculate also assuming that there's a threshold that we see here, the distributions of the delay times.
experiments I don't have time to show here indicate that the criterion for catastrophe is not the total number of the EB binding sites, but actually the density in the highest EB binding site re region. All right, so this uh, concludes the part about the mechanism of uh, microtubule catastrophe, and we're pretty excited about it because what we have learned we want to apply now for the steady state situation and develop a quantitative model of uh, catastrophe frequencies based on kinetic parameters of uh, microtubule growth. So in the last part, I will briefly show you um, a different type of experiment that we did recently, and this addresses the question of how microtubule nucleation is regulated. If you think about microtubule nucleation, this is a very interesting process because you have to go through a number of kinetically very unfavorable states. So it's very unlikely to nucleate a microtubule. And I would like to introduce you to the effect on nucleation of two other proteins um, that uh, preferentially bind to microtubule ends, and these are these two proteins, CHTOG and TPX2. So the biological background of this question here um, concerns the local regulation of microtubule nucleation during mitosis or meiosis. And in the Xenopus egg extract, it has been very well established that there is a run GTP gradient in mitosis around chromosomes with a high concentration of run GTP around the chromosomes that releases um, the inhibitory action of importance from spindle assembly factors. And these spindle assembly factors, they have then positive influences and functions for spindle assembly. And one of the roles is um, local non-centrosomal microtubule nucleation around the chromosomes. So we all know that the main nucleator of microtubules in cells is gamma tubulin or the gamma tubulin ring complex. This can also be nicely shown by depletion experiments in Xenopus egg extract. However, this gamma tubulin ring complex is not really an established target of this run GTP pathway. So how is locality of nucleation then controlled? So there are other factors that have been implicated, and one of them is the um, Xenopus um, protein XMAP215 is a microtubule associated protein. And um, this has been shown to be a microtubule polymerase uh, originally by Mark Kirschner and then has been carefully studied by the Howard lab. And when you remove this protein from Xenopus egg extract, you also see that nucleation around, um, in this case, chromatin-covered beads is strongly inhibited. However, this protein is also not an established run GTP target. However, there's this protein TPX2, and TPX2 is also important for nucleation in in the system, and this is now finally an established run GTP target. So how is uh, nucleation controlled? There seem to be several proteins somehow important, and how can we explain the locality of nucleation control in the system? So I will focus on these two proteins at the bottom, and first of all, we had to uh, demonstrate that the human homolog of XMAP215 essentially behaves like the frog protein. This is a protein that um, polymerizes, uh, that accelerates the polymerization of microtubules, as you saw here. And you see this also in the chymographs, a uh, space time plot. And this is a protein that likes to accumulate in a completely EB1 independent manner at the growing microtubules, where it accelerates the addition of tubulins to growing microtubule ends. This is dose dependent, and it behaves essentially like the Xenopus proteins. This uh, TPX2 protein has not so much studied with respect to effects on microtubule dynamics or localization. Um, it binds all along microtubules, as you can see here. And if you reduce the concentration, you see something interesting. Um, this is an experiment with segmented microtubules. We put uh, microtubule pieces which have been stabilized with the G with GMP-CPP, a non-hydrolyzable GTP analog on the surface, and then we let the microtubules grow, and you see that this protein here, the TPX2, also likes to bind to growing microtubule ends, and it does it again independently of EB1. It's one of these few uh, proteins that you can find sometimes under specific conditions. We have at very low protein uh, concentrations here at microtubule ends. So we thought that's interesting, um, because the end is a bit similar to the nucleus, perhaps. 
And um, when you look at the dynamic properties or at the effect on the dynamic properties of the microtubules, this is complementary now to what uh, CH talk or XMAP215 do. Um, this TPX2 has hardly any effect on the growth velocity, um, but it suppresses the catastrophe or frequency of the microtubules. So it stabilizes them somehow by making the catastrophe a less likely event. So how do these end binders now affect a non-templated nucleation, meaning nucleation of microtubules in the absence of gamma tubulin. So we set up an experiment, an assay, in which we immobilize proteins on the surface of glass, and then we look by turf microscopy at uh, what tubulin in solution does, if it nucleates or not. If microtubules nucleate, they will bind uh, to the microtubule binding proteins we put on the glass. And this is a control here. So you see just an, um, a dead kinesin on the surface, so you accumulate a bit of tubulin and a bit of maybe tubulin oligomers. If you have this polymerase CH TOG, you see that uh, microtubules nucleate and they grow comparatively fast. And if we have this TPX2 protein on the surface that is important for local regulation of nucleation in Xenopus, um, we see this. So we see that somehow stuff comes down to the surface, um, not very pretty. And if you want to be very optimistic, you uh, can go to the literature and see that um, there is a proposition that maybe nucleation intermediates could look like this. So this made us worry if maybe we have started nucleation on the surface, but by being on a surface somehow blocked it at the same time. So we changed the assay, and this is something which Johanna Rost alluded in the lab. Um, she pre-incubated first um, the proteins we wanted to study with tubulin, they were biotinylated and then transferred them to the surface which had uh, nutravidin bound. And uh, what you then see is that in the CH talk example, you still see the microtubules being recruited to the, uh, to the surface. And, but now you see also that in the case of TPX2, you get massive nucleation of microtubules that now bind to the surface. However, the microtubules grow considerably more slowly. This is a dose-dependent effect. And if you now combine both of these proteins, you get massive nucleation of very fast-growing microtubules on the surface. So together, um, these two proteins in solution can very effectively nucleate the microtubules. And finally, the last experiment, um, we can also reconstitute the regulation of this nucleation by importance. So importance inhibit um, inhibit uh, the nucle uh, inhibit the TPX2 in mitosis. And uh, when you have an experiment where you have, in this case, GFP labeled TPX2, uh, tubulin and CH TOG in solution, and you bring them onto a surface, you see that you have efficient nucleation of microtubules, fast growth, and TPX2 binding all along the microtubules. And when you now add important, you see that nucleation is very strongly reduced, and you also see that TPX2 binding is very strongly reduced, meaning that the importance block the ability of TPX2 to interact with the microtubules. Okay, so we think that this is the first step towards the reconstitution of a key module regulating the locality of uh, nucleation control during cell division. So the model of how these two proteins work we think they act directly on the nucleus of um, microtubule assembly. The CH TOG um, accelerates <coughs> the elongation of the protofilaments of this nucleus, we propose, whereas the TPX2 prevents disassembly of these nu nu nuclei. And uh, it's obviously interesting now to ask next how together with the uh, gamma tubulin ring complex, which templates these nuclei, um, these activities will cooperate with. Okay, so to conclude, um, in summary, I hoped I could convince you um, that these in vitro reconstitutions can give you insight about molecular mechanisms of how the cytoskeleton works. In the first part, um, I showed you an example of a reconstitution of a protein interaction network at growing microtubule ends, and I stress the importance of um, a hierarchical recruitment mode um, for recruitment in the presence of competition, and uh, I showed you some experiments that suggest that 
the Microtubal N can be seen as an initiation platform uh, for processive dynein motility. In the second part, I showed you some experiments using uh, EB1 as a sensor um, of conformational changes in the microtubule end, and we interpret the EB1 binding region as the protective cap of the microtubule, and we conclude that this cap is long, and uh, the major conclusion is that by looking at um, this EB1 cap, we can measure the instantaneous stability of microtubules in situ, um, which we can now also do at the steady state and in cells, not only in this washout experiment. In the, in the final part, I showed you some, experiment, uh, some experiments where we looked at the regulation of the locality of uh, nucleation. And uh, I proposed that this TPX2 protein, which is regulatable by the RUN-GTP gradient and CHTOG, which is not, uh, synergize to stabilize um, the nucleus of microtubule polymerization. So to conclude, um, I would like to acknowledge uh, the people who did all this work. I highlight in red everybody who was directly involved in the uh, experiments I showed you today. Um, I thank my current lab members, my previous lab members. Uh, very important, uh, our collaborators, which was very uh, very fun to work with them, and we always learn a lot. And of course, um, I would like to thank our sponsors, with, um, without whom this would all not be possible. <coughs> all right. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'm happy to try to answer. Yes, so Thomas, thanks again. I think we can all see why uh, he's a worthy hook work matter winner using the approach of better scopes and clear thinking to see further like hook taught us to. And I think we have time for questions. So, shall we start? Let's start with... Uh... Well, first, congratulations. Beautiful talk. And I, uh, I just I have two questions, really. One is um, about the the very large cap that you see, uh, and, and the very beautiful evidence you have for it. But the question is, um, uh, will you get enough fluctuation in the cap to account for the, the rate of catastrophe? I mean, and how would you get that? What kind of model do you visualize that would give you that? Yeah, so um, I think, so this is the most important question now, how to relate this idea with um, the steady state behavior of the microtubules. And there are various models out there. And in the classical models, uh, a long cap model usually failed to show um, the dependence of the catastrophe frequency on the tubulin concentration or the growth velocity. Mm -hmm. So that's a problem here. But since a few years, we know that the microtubule growth fluctuates much more than we initially thought, mm. because essentially both the on and the off rate during um, assembly have been observed by the Howard lab and by OD lab to be much higher than we originally thought. So this um, adds to the fluctuations. And um, I'm not sure we fully understand at the moment if this is enough to explain the catastrophe frequencies as we observe them. But what we are doing is we measure the EB cap fluctuations at the moment. And uh, the fluctuations of the EB cap we see are in agreement with the kinetics of how the cap is formed. That's fine. And we try now to use our criterion we have extracted for the catastrophe induction together with the measured EB fluctuations to explain uh, the dependence of the catastrophe frequency on the growth velocity. I guess this is the second question I have it is, uh, I, I mean, I think that's a great, great point to be. It's still a problem that worked out. But um, do you think this, uh, uh, something I thought about years ago was a question about whether the growth rates would be heterogeneous. And um, the heterogeneity seemed to me most, uh, if, uh, if there were, and it is, uh, best explained by, by the actual structure of the microtubule itself, which uh, is not like an actin filament where there's uh, one place a subunit can go on, but the ends of the microtubules uh, 
yes. are actually quite variable, I mean, in, in, uh, in structure. And presumably, it could have different kinetics of assembly and disassembly. Is mean, that the way you're thinking about it as well? Yes. So um, what I have not shown here is that you can use this washout experiment also to address the question of um, the fact that microtubules age, so they become less stable when they get a bit older. And the OD lab mostly has promoted the idea that this is then due to an increased uh, taper length, so the microtubule end does not grow as a blunt tube, but the protofilaments can have different lengths, and the discrepancy in the lengths is called the taper lengths. And um, we see that with this idea, we can explain um, the effects of aging um, on the waiting times we can measure in the dilution experiment. So I also think that we have to consider the structure of the microtubule end as it develops over time and maybe also um, in terms of its variability it can have at any time point. It could, be, uh, it could, be that the, um, could have been that the uh, microtubule ends interconvert very quickly to give an average value, but that apparently doesn't be the case. We, we will see. So, uh, yeah, Thomas Garrison, and, and in a related way, when you have nucleation without a template, do you get variation in protofilaments and, and things? And also, it looked more curved in some of your, in, in some of the experiments. For nucleation, you get curved microtubules versus straight. Is that, a, is that to do with the structure as well? Yes, so um, it's well known that when you nucleate microtubules in vitro in the absence of the tubulin gamma ring complex, which templates a nice certain protofilament microtubule, that you have a variety of protofilament numbers in your microtubules. And the curved nature of the microtubules you observed in our movies, in some cases at least, has something to do with this TPX2 protein liking to bind to curved structures. And we think that the curvature of the nucleus before it closes into a tube is different and this is why the TPX2 can stabilize it. And we see that this thing curves the mic tools. Uh, here, over here. Uh, beautiful talk. Um, do you think that the TPX1 uh, is basically a model also for how other shaft binders like Tau, MAP1B, or Spectra plugins may influence plastic behavior? And how, do they actually have to be close to the plastic? Because somehow the re recruitment during fast polymerization, of course, close to the tip will, will be a problem for many of those. Yeah, so I think to really answer how these different maps influence the growth properties of the microtubules, we need to have the structures. We need to know where exactly they bind. I think we have good evidence that the binding site of the TPX2 on the microtubule is not identical to the binding site of the EV1, so it looks like at least in part the binding sites don't overlap, they can be there at the same time. Um, about the other maps, I don't know. So you can, and regarding the question, if you have to be always in, at the end of the microtubule when you want to stabilize it, uh, you can stabilize the microtubules in different ways, so if you code the lattice of the microtubule, uh, with a protein that prevents the depolymerization, the microtubule will be stable. So uh, I think there are different ways to stabilize a microtubule. You can prevent the depolymerization, you can suppress the catastrophe frequency, you can accelerate the growth. So different maps will do it in different ways. And we need to have the kinetic information and have to combine it with the structural information to really get the mechanism, I think. We also have time for one student and one postdoc question, at least, so get thinking, please. Yeah. Is it clear which cargos, which dining cargos need the EB1 recruitment to get them moving? That's not clear to me. I think the literature is, I'm, I'm not sure uh, the literature makes a clear statement there. I mean, in our in vitro experiment, we are inspired by what we read in the literature. And then we can try to combine the molecules that are suggested and then observe the behavior. So in this case, we could see that the, um, the EB1 can recruit the dinactin and then this can bind to the dynein 
but because our dynein dynaptin weakly interacting complex is non-processive, you need to add a processivity factor as you have shown to start the runs. How much this is a general concept, we don't know. What is sure is that the runs can also start away from the microtubule end. So we have to analyze more quantitatively now how strong the bias is if there's a bias. Any final questions? Back? No? Okay, well, uh, let's all thank Thomas again for a fabulous talk.